OBS is recording, everything is under control. Good. Yeah, man, how you doing? Pretty good, man. Uh, yeah. Super excited about the Cynthia project now that things are, are getting outlined and, and scheduled and everything. Oh, man, I can't wait. We're all excited. Yeah, We're me talking too. about nothing but this. Yeah, I think it's like, um, like I was saying, it's like all of those, like, I mean, we aim for like 2,500. I think that's super easy to do. And then we, it's like every little thing we, we add to the feature, every little, like, every little, um, sorry, I haven't had my coffee yet. Every little, um, like, like perk or every little ability we add to owning just increases the chance of success by that. You know, ten percent, ten percent, until the point where we're just looking at it, going, "Oh, this is a hundred percent." You know, and it's nice to walk into a project where um, you're convinced everything's a hundred percent. It's like the best feeling. Yeah, yeah, totally. I, I'm super excited to get her hardware upgraded. Like, she's just running on my home computer right now, and I'd love to get her off <laughs> of that and into her own system. So she runs on your she runs on your home computer for generating art, and then she plugs yeah. into GPT three for for voice or like some kind of yep. service yep that's exactly it um yeah. we're we're redesigning her back end to make it so that she's portable and we can move her to a new platform once the time comes mm. um that's still in process yeah it's interesting that cynthia is kind of like an ai made out she's sort of, sort of a patchwork ai isn't she she's like <laughs> yeah. she's, a, she's approaching a general ai but by slapping together as many models as possible yeah, I mean, honestly, I think that's what the industry is doing, too. Yeah. Like, we've got all these different components. We've got image recognition. We've got language models. We've got you know, executive functions. And the key is going to be finding out how to combine them all together in a way that gives you a full brain. Like a protocol for all of those models to communicate with each other. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's the, that's the key. Because then, I mean, it might not be as robust as, like, you know, like some massive quantum computer that google has somewhere but it will mean that there's way more of them and and that'll probably end up being where all the interesting stuff happens yeah for sure mm. yeah that's sick yeah i was kind of like my brain's a bit dead this week um so i was thinking it'd be cool um, when mike gets in if we can just like run some dali prompts and talk shit but, um, yeah, yeah. that would be great. I've got some experiments that I want to run on Dali, so I, I'd love to get my hands on it. Yeah. So he, he recently um, was given access to it um, thanks to Justin. So he's been fucking around. And um, I'll give him a text and see where he's at because um, I think he's going to jump in and we're just going to like spend the day just dicking around instead of, um, instead of trying to make smart talk because um, Alex's brain is not capable of smart talk this week, I don't think. No, that's good. Mine is, <laughs> mine is like scrambled eggs today too, man. I, it's totally. I'm sucking down coffee right now, and it's not doing anything. Uh, yeah, me too. I've been. I've like. I'm working on a bunch of documents and stuff, and and like just staring at these blank pages, trying to put words together. <laughs> like that's been my entire week. It's uh, it's been really oh, tough. Oh God. Yeah, I hear that. Um. Yeah. Anyway, I like I like these these regular talks, man. They're they're like um, one of the things that I really enjoy. So I am. Totally, totally happy about that. I was thinking about, yeah, me um, too. yeah, I was thinking about, um, so like one of the things I'm noticing with these talks is we're starting to like come up with a few different ideas. Like, um, like Mike and I often mention the idea of these, um, like the taco stands being one of the first outlets for like just everyone having access to AI. Um, yeah. you know, like all these small stores just starting to just essentially, it's like essentially every, Every small business has a free illustrator that works for them as a slave. And like, how would they exploit that? Right. Right. Um, yeah. So that's like one kind of model that we're starting to develop. And then the other is I was thinking just shit posters, right? Like that's where we're seeing most AI now is like with this uh, Dali mini, it's, it's like all the meme pages, all the shit posters, just posting random stuff. Yeah. Like the, dro like the, the Joe Biden trail cam. Shit. Yeah, like, or, or my attempts with Drew Biden on Mid Journey that got me banned. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Did you hear about those? Oh I my showed him an example. Uh, they they got really dark. <laughs> <laughs> how uh, how long until after you generated that image were you banned? Was it like immediate or did something... no? I, I managed to get like eighty of them out. Like I, I got like a lot of generations out. That's why it's so fucked up and, and visceral. Visceral. Um, but yeah, so I, I like I say, like, yeah, cool, you know. 
and you get to the point with mid journey where you have like four threads open and you just like expand, you know, you know, like, um, whatever, like, um, you know, publish a high up scaled version pub. So I was just had like 20 of those on the go and it was like, my queue is all full and I was like, I'm just going to go to bed. And I wake up in the oh morning, like, oh, I'm like, okay, let's check these out. And then as soon as I tried to hit like create variation, it was just like, you cannot, and I'm like, Hey, wait a minute. And I looked and I was just like blocked. So. <laughs> So they didn't kick you out of the server. They just cut your access off. No, they yeah, they kicked me out of the server because uh, I was using oh. a because I was using Mid Journey as like a direct bot, like a like a DM. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah, I figured that was like you know, um, I didn't have to like share my depravity with anyone else that way. Um, <laughs> but it caught up with me, you know. Um, I got like eighty two really fucked up images out of it, so you know, I don't know. They can't they can't stop me now. I can just like Worth it. make a sock and just just get it out there. <laughs> but I'm um, not doing the direct DM thing for Cynthia, but um, I I, I kind of like the community building aspect more. Yeah, like, no, I think I think generating images in the community, not DMs. I think that's where Mid Journey is falling falling um falling away. It's like I think that they're like that their process. I think I lost you. I don't know if that's my connection or if that's yours. My headphones are playing up, but um. It was. Okay. Yeah. So um. Yeah. No. I think the Cynthia, like the way Cynthia, what Cynthia has going over Mid Journey is that it's um it's something you can take to different servers and build communities. Like, um, I think that the channel system in Mid Journey is kind of like a little impersonal. Yeah. Um, yeah, it is. But being able to have like a very specific community have access to Cynthia and then like work with her in their own way, without worrying about like having to have their own channel or, you know, everyone feels more comfy in their in their own server. So right, I think that's the yeah, that's the key. Yeah, we still need to jump through the Discord hoops to get her verified, and fortunately, there are a lot of hoops to jump through. Yeah, yeah. No, we're we're still right. like working on that as well. Just haven't felt like reading through the documentation because they've got like pages and pages of docs of things you have to ch like checklists you have to go through and and things you have to have in place before they even yeah start the so i submitted process. like a oh i tried to do it for this server but then they um i i've tried to do it a number of times and we just like don't have all of the correct documentation because we're like an online company yeah um Oh, anyway, that's another conversation. Oh, do you guys have a bot? No, I think yeah, she's talking about Hammer just. Bot. We have Hammerbot, but no, I think she's she's talking oh. about uh just just trying to get verification for the server itself. Oh, for the yeah. server. Okay, yeah. gotcha. Yeah. Even that is a nightmare. Hammer made Hammerbot. It's just he's like this little like just beep boop bot that just says stuff randomly. He's not as sim he's not as sophisticated as Cynthia. Where's uh? How do you interact with Hammerbot? What does Hammerbot do? He doesn't do anything. He just he randomly tells you to look out for your safety. Oh, but that's, oh I have but seen that's, that. Okay. But that's good enough, right? You can like, also like interact with him in in the get help channel. Okay. Um, and he'll answer questions about the drop. Yeah. Okay. No, he's he's just like a little. He's a simple. He's a simple lad, but he's like you know he gets the job done. I don't want to talk shit about Hammerbot because Hammer's listening, and I know how I know how like um how emotional he gets about his baby. Sure, I I understand that a hundred percent. So going so going back to what I was saying, it's like yeah, the I think we've kind of got this model that we're making about you know the idea of these small small shops and small businesses are going to have access to illustrations, um, and then the other the other pressure I think will be shit posters who just have you know the unlimited ability now to just like generate um like any random garbage right yeah and I, th and I think that's what we're seeing the most when it comes to AI like um obviously not so much with Dali because you know they're pretty stringent about what you can and, and can't do but when it comes to Dali mini um like the amount of like um shit posts you see come out of that is is just epic right so I think that's going to be another major pressure is that we're going to see a lot, a lot of the art 
that we see generated with um, with uh, AI is going to be used for memes, or it's going to be used for just you know nonsense, and that's probably going to start creating its own um, dialogue or its own kind of internal um, internal uh, sort of memes um, syntax. Yes. I want to make a bot that comes up with its own memes. <laughs> um, that that's going to happen eventually. Probably have to wait till like GPT four when it's a little bit smarter. But uh, yeah, it's it's going to happen. But I've already got Cynthia. I think she can dream up her own prompts. Yeah. So she can come up with her own content. But coming up with memes is going to be a thing. I love I love the uh, AI shit posting. Um, yeah. Let me show you guys this one. Is that in Cynthia posting. channel? Yeah. So somebody came up with filet minion. <laughs> it's so stupid. It's so stupid, but I love it. Oh my god, that's cool. Uh, wait, did that? Did that? Is that a prompt or is that a Photoshop? That's a prompt. Yeah. Oh man, awesome. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I like the the broomstick with boobs as well. It's pretty good. Yeah. So yeah, yeah I think it's got all the right elements. Yeah, I think ship posting is going to be one of the biggest aspects of this, you know, and I think that's where we're going to see the majority of the output is going to be just people creating nonsense. Yeah, so for sure. those are the two factors that I, I, there's so many more, obviously, like artists are going to be using it, you know, for their art. But I, I think that like, I want to just try and think of these, like, like what are the biggest, most normy ways that AI is going to affect the world, you know? And, um, you know, art, artists are such a minority that I'm sure, and um, they're going to come up with a million different ways that are all going to be different to each other. So they get kind of all, it's kind of, it's more like an outskirts stuff, you know, but what's sitting in the middle, like what is the biggest effect on society with AI? And um, I think that's it. And also I, I was kind of thinking like, you know, when I was fucking around with this stuff on mid journey, I was like, well, you could, you could really propagandize uh, through AI really easily, you know, um, all you have to do is like sort of, put in your political opponent and then just put in a bunch of hateful words and the AI will, you know, make their face contorted or screaming and it can be really compelling. Yeah. So I think wow, that's, I uh, think that. you know, that's like, cause it's like being able to just say, okay, this is my political opponent, make their face contorted, make them scream, put them, put them in a compromising position um, and create 80 images. Like um, there's something to be said for consistency uh, over like something that's said for noise over signal. Right. And if you can, yeah. if you can just generate a thousand of these images and put them out in the ecosystem, that can have an effect, you know. So that's like a new weapon in in politics. God, yes. So yeah, that's probably one of the reasons why, one of the many reasons why Dali doesn't do likenesses, like specific likenesses. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. But honestly, sure. yeah, it, it's a matter of time before some other model comes out just as good as Dali that will let you do that. It's gonna happen. I mean, there's really no. Like I get what they're doing, I understand why they're doing it, but it's senseless because eventually somebody will come up with something. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm gonna just uh, I'm just gonna text Mike uh, now and see where he's at. But yeah, I mean, yeah. like I think Dali Mini is a really good example of that, you know, like, um, yeah. and that's like a pretty basic model, but it still gets the job done, right? Exactly. Like, yeah, it doesn't need to be photorealistic. I think that's the thing. It's like people think, oh, you know, as long as it's not photorealistic or it doesn't, it, it can't really trick anyone like into thinking that it's real, then it won't have any negative effect. But the truth is, it's not so much about, um, it's not so much about tricking a, an individual into into thinking something's real, but rather tricking the part of their brain that agrees with confirmation bias. You know, so if you can, if you can, or, or consensus bias. So if you can create um, you know, 500 images that are all fake and really obviously fake, but bombard someone with them enough, that has a much more powerful effect than giving them one image that they might think is real for like five minutes, you know? And I think that's the real issue here. And I don't think uh, photorealism has really has anything to do with that. It's more of just, it's just a matter of bombarding someone. I think we see that yeah. with advertising, you know? We, we see that with advertising. We see that with social media. I mean, that's why social media is so polarizing because the algorithm puts you in box A or box B and only shows you things that a box A person or a box B person would want to see. So you yeah. get trapped in this echo chamber. And, and when you're confronted with ideas that come from box B, you're like, nobody believes that. Everybody that I know believes 
what box a believes you know so absolutely totally. i mean yeah, yeah just bombard people with garbage all day long and they'll, they'll start to believe it yeah exactly that's it, exactly it you know it's not like it's not like anything on twitter is like um intelligent or well thought out but it, it's just right. there you know and it's it's like yeah. you can just give someone an opinion enough until they they go okay well you know everyone else is thinking it so i may as well get on board otherwise you know i'll be ostracized and that's yeah really everyone else is thinking it and i haven't seen any counterpoints so it must yeah. be true yeah uh, most people think like that you know um, oh, of course. It's one of the. That's I, I one think of the, we're all, all guilty of that. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's part of our. It's part of our. Um, we've evolved to think like that. So, it's it's yeah, one of it's, those. It's one of those biohacks that we have to be really careful about. You know. Exactly. I mean, just think about like when we scroll social media. How many ideas do you get confronted with? Hundreds, hundreds yeah. of new ideas, and how many of those are you going to fact check? None of them. Yeah. <laughs> you know. So uh, over time, that that's all going to sink in and become part of your identity. So when you're in a conversation with somebody, you're arguing with somebody, you're going to pull out a fact. You don't, you don't know where you got that fact from. You saw it on social media somewhere a few weeks ago, you know? Yeah, well, Did you fact my, check my, it? Who my knows? algorithm mainly just sends me schizo posting. So, you know, I don't know what that's, <laughs> I don't know what that's about. I, I get, I get dogs and like shit posts. And that's yeah. No, nah, main, mainly I'm just schizo posts and, and that's fine. I'm happy with that. I think the algorithms worked me out. That's probably healthier than <laughs> politics. <laughs> um so that's that's uh yeah i'm, I'm just uh, text mike again see if where he's at but um yeah that's uh what else we got oh do you want to help us out with some conversation keep us from having some dead dead air yeah um okay uh i guess like thinking about what you were saying with the rearrangement of different components and lack of photorealism, it's kind of like typoglycemia, right? Where you like have words with a different rearrangement of letters, but as long as the bookend letters, so like A at the beginning of the word and like, I don't know, Y at, at the end of the word is in the correct placement, you're able to recognize that the word is apology, right? So... As much as I think that confirmation bias and politicization is like a very big part of this conversation, I think it's also like the way in which we process information, process imagery is worthy of consideration. Um, because we will look at the outline of a thing rather than like each specific component of it in order to determine what it is. Um, yeah, yeah, that, that's like that's a big part of like our psyche is just using pattern recognition. And uh, that's probably a big part of what this this issue is. It's it's we we rely on like pattern recognition for most of how we think, and we also rely on like consensus for a lot of how we think. But that kind of that kind of actually reminds me. I, I was um I, I saw this really cool app recently called Bionic Reading. Have you guys have you guys looked into that? It's a filter for Chrome that no. will will go through um, large slabs of text and and just highlight uh, stuff that like creates patterns out of the words so you don't have to read the whole thing and if you're, you're like that's oh i have seen that yeah yeah my I've brain something very similar. Yeah. yeah my brain works like that so it's just saved my life it's really good oh wait what's that called again uh bionic reading essentially it's like a, cool. a like a filter that just goes through huge slabs of text and will like just highlight like make certain letters bold to help like sort of pattern recognition for words instead of having to read the whole word It's a little off topic, it's, but yeah. It was it's originally, really no, it was originally discern, like a design for people with like ADD and dyslexia, right? Like yeah, they probably. used that font to help with dyslexic um, computation. Yeah, that explains why it works for me. Mm, 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 mm. Oh, this is really cool. So yeah, I think it was supported on Kindle for like, a long time and then they like imported it over onto the internet so let's uh i mean we're going to be having a we're having a cynthia talk uh, after this aren't we justin we are yeah well, let's uh let's um let's just use this time to go through a few ideas as well while we're at it because um you know why not hell yeah why not um so yeah i i think the the biggest the biggest thing that we, the biggest hurdle we're facing right now with Cynthia is like, what does the first like uh, membership token look like? You know, is that, 
um, I was talking to uh, Serotonin and he was like, okay, look, you know, if we're going to be making 10,000 images or 5,000 images, you know, we're going to need more GPUs. But maybe um, the key is to the key is to actually create something generative, um, like a member token or something like that, and then give maybe allow the user or the subscriber over the course of the life of the subscription to then pick their favorite piece that they've made and then have that turned into the artwork at the end of that um, session. Is that something that's possible? Yeah, I, I was thinking about that too, um, because if we're going to have 2,500 units, um, in, in my mind, they would be 2,500 like high res images. Yeah. Right. But but a high res image takes about 30 minutes to generate. Yeah. So that's like what 1250 hours. That's that's crazy. Um, so like I don't know how we would that we would do that and and then also make sure that these images are of quality, right? We don't want to just spit out garbage. Yeah. Um, so a token then. Uh, talk a little bit more about that. Well, I mean, we could create like a like a we could create a a like a a placer image for the membership, right? So like um, some kind of artwork or something that sort of suggests that the person is a. I don't like the idea of these like people create like these three D spinning cards or some shit. It's like this is my three D spinning card. I think that's kind mm -hmm. of cheesy, um, and it's also yeah. like bringing like we don't. It doesn't need to be a card. It doesn't need to be represented as a card. You know. But essentially what it is, is like a keychain graphic, you know, to say this is my membership token and, and um, it, the graphic on it isn't as important as what it represents, you know, the artwork that it has. But what we could do is, is over the course of their subscription, let's just say that they buy a one year subscription to Cynthia and there's one piece of art that they make or one piece of art that they particularly love and then they can have that updated to so the IPFS for the... So the, the token itself can link to a new IPFS link of the artwork that they've created. So over the course of the year, each one of the people, each one of the subscribers can generate the artwork that they want the NFT to be. I didn't know you could do that. I thought that those were totally immutable. Uh, no, I, so what you can do is I, you can- IPFS? Yeah, so you can, you can create an NFT um, and it can link to a JSON file. So uh, every NFT that you create um, blah, 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 you know, NFT number one links to a JSON file number one, and that JSON file can have the IPFS link in it, um, the, you know, metadata, um, rarity traits and stuff like that. But that JSON file okay. can be updated. Oh, cool. So, you know, you, you can, so essentially, I mean, as a, a, the NFT itself is immutable, but what it links to can be dynamic. That's cool. Okay. Awesome. So, I didn't know that. Yeah. So... So we could, you know, we could have it so that the server uploads it to a, to uh, the so Cynthia uploads, you know, the one image that they like the most to a server, and then they can have some kind of function in her where they're like, you know, mint this as my as my artwork, and you know, some kind of magic happens behind the scenes, and the IPFS gets updated, and that that becomes their artwork. Perfect. I love it. So, yeah, and then yeah. that sort of spreads out the the processing over the course of a year instead of trying to do it all in in a few weeks. Do it in a week. Yeah, yeah. totally. Okay, cool. Yeah, I like that a lot more. So yeah, that, I mean that okay. that was one thing we could do. Um, and so then, we start off with kind of a placeholder image then. Yeah, or maybe we can like sort of talk to key people in the community, and we can uh, like get everyone to work together. Like you know, I'm sure that you've got a bunch of people on your server who are like really passionate about Cynthia, and everyone mm -hmm. can sort of work together to create like a um, either a series of images or um, or just choose one image. The other aspect is we could probably create an image and then like use elements from it to generate a batch as well. So um, we could say, you know, uh, get Cynthia to make some stuff on a white background, um, you know, or maybe different types of backgrounds and different types of things on the foreground, maybe a bit of Photoshop jiggery, and then uh, create a generative process as well. And that saves a lot of processing power because we're kind yeah. of chopping, we're chopping up stuff that pre-exists. Totally. Um, okay. yeah, I mean, that's still, that's still pretty intensive. Like with the Vils project, we had to have like, you know, four towers running for a week, oh, um, geez. but it's still way better than trying to get like, um, you know, generate like actual, like AI art. Plus you don't know what the fuck is going to happen, you know, like with AI art, it can be. That's the thing. Yeah. Generate a hundred images, 75 of them could be garbage. Yeah. So, um, that's, uh, that's like a one potential 
idea for it. Um, yeah. Like maybe we, yeah, we could probably crowdsource the Cynthia, uh, the Cynthia users and get them to like come up with something that we want as like our first place of image, you know, maybe uh, like an, we can update a portrait and, you know, get, get everyone to sort of vote on what she looks like. Yeah. You know, actually I, I have been thinking about rebranding her. Um, I, I don't know. Like if you guys look at her profile picture, she's got um, actually, let me show you. It's all like your you one, the inspiration. Right? Yeah, it's it's mine's the black and white version of, of hers. Yeah. Um, but so when I first built Cynthia way back in September of last year, she was written in PowerShell. Um, because it was the only language I knew. Mm. Um, and if there's any developers listening right now, they're, they're probably laughing. Um, but let me let me show you why she looks the way she does. Um, one sec, quick search here. So. Uh, this is the PowerShell mascot. All right, one sec. I don't, I don't know why a scripting language needs a mascot, but it does. Um, so yeah, if you look at that, you can see it's it's remarkably similar. Um, oh yeah. So once once we start going more public with Cynthia, I, I I'd like to avoid any kind of copyright issues that may arise from that. And plus, she's not written in PowerShell anymore; she's all Python. So yeah. Um, yeah so there's maybe... no need for her to look like that. Well, maybe that's the first step of, of the project is to kind of create like a community uh, project of rebranding a um, coming up with a new identity. Yeah, um, I, I like I like theming it like you know like like let's all build Cynthia like let's everybody get together and we'll we'll, we'll build her from the ground up. Yeah. Um, you contribute monetarily, you get to help decide what she looks like. Essentially, yeah. we'll have to figure out how to make that happen. And we we all get kisses from her when she when she's a human. <laughs> this little little yeah. pecs on the cheek, maybe you know. Yeah, we'll we'll start manufacturing little Cynthia clones, and we'll send them out yeah. to your house, and yeah, we'll they'll, do, they'll do whatever just, you want. No they're questions just, asked. They're just flashlights on legs. It's really fucked up. <laughs> oh, I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's that's probably the way to do it, man. And you know, like it's it's kind of cool that she can like create her own. Maybe she can create her own auto, like a self portrait, and um. So I, I was fucking around with an AI that I had called Joy Love, which was just like this. I was using like various notebooks to create like outputs, and um, and I one of the first things I did with her is I uh, I just said, okay, let's let's make a self portrait, right? And yeah. I I thought that that could be a really interesting thing to do with with uh, you know uh, Cynthia is just sort of create like a community project where everyone's trying to work out the perfect prompt to create a like a kind of a consistent self-portrait of what we think she looks like. And then, um, and then maybe yeah. we just do like a bunch of outputs and everyone just uh, votes on what they think is best. Or we pick the, you know, a hundred best ones and then um, work out some kind of way of applying a generative process to that. So that everyone has it like a unique version of it. That's like a derived from the same version. And, like, I don't think we really want to add anything like rarity traits or anything like that to this subscription model because it's not really about collecting and selling. It's about just, you know, supporting and getting access to the utility. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, they can, exactly. you know, they can all be kind of based on the same one or they could all be the same one, you know. But I yeah, think that yeah, that, we, we can gamify it in such a way that people are contributing to her, her end appearance. Um, but, yeah, I, I don't think there's a need for rarities or anything like that yeah yeah totally and and then with this run yeah i mean like that's the thing it's like all of these kind of ideas and stuff can be added in the future um like there's no reason to say that like once you have enough gpu power and cynthia can do like a generative process or generative project that we can't like try and program a um a rarity like a, a pfp project that has like rarity inbuilt and have some kind of like ai generated a PFP, which would be really interesting. Um, but let's just, you know, one step at a time. And I think that's what makes it really interesting and why people would be interested in backing this because it's like, it's kind of different to like buying a, a mid journey subscription where you you kind of know what your, 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 um, your product's going to be. The difference with Cynthia is right. it's sort of like, okay, you know, you're supporting the idea that you can, you can fuck around with her on discord. That's the first thing, but also you're supporting the idea that in six months from now, uh, when we come up with a weird idea, like let's create like a, a generated PFP project based on this sort of prompt string that we've come up with that has a consistent output. 
um, that yeah. you're going to be able to get that or you're going to be able to be a part of that. So it's, it's more like, um, it's a, like a very experimental version of mid journey that you get access to. Yeah. Yeah. Very experimental. I mean, I, I want to keep pushing the boundaries and making her more fun, more interesting, more intriguing. Yeah. Um, and, and more, more personified too. I want people to actually be able to build relationships with a bot as, as weird as that might be. Um, yeah. people, people are, are trying to do that and, and it's disappointing because her memory gets reset every night. Um, and she only has a, uh, four message attention span. Yeah. Um, but, but I, I see that changing in the future, uh, as, as resources improve, as technology improves. Yeah, I think that's the key. No, hundred percent. That's the key because, uh, her, her personality is what people are, are coming for really at the end of the day. That's what makes it different from, you know, just being able to use a notebook or something. Yeah, I mean, for better or for worse. I mean, there are people that like talking to SH, and there are people that like to be insulted uh, incessantly. Yeah. It's kind of funny. Yo, Mike, how you doing, man? Hey, Mike. Oh, hey, what's up? Hey, Hello? dude. Yo. Uh, so... You're a little bit choppy. In New York? Um, can you hear me? Yeah, now Hello? we can. Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, I'm inside of They're actually coincidentally having an uh, and it's all oh, right, oh, man. Man, man, I, th I think we, ca we caught it that you're at Super Chief and they're having an AI uh, exhibition. Oh, but your, your, your connection's really shit. Can you hear me now? Kinda, man. It's uh, it's not coming in great. He's becoming AI. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Hello. Yeah, man. I, your connection's bad. Yeah, we lost him. Um, oh. Yeah, sounds like he's yeah, at her, that um, NFT NYC stuff. Um, probably oh, okay, at cool. Super Chief, where they've got like some kind of AI thing happening. Uh, bummer. Hopefully we catch him again soon. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, it's a casual talk today, man. Like I said, my brain is fucked. Yeah, no, I, I'm right there with you, man. I am too. Mm. I've been on calls and doing interviews and stuff nonstop, and it's just exhausting. Oh, that's awesome, though. About Cynthia. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I've been working with this uh, this root beer company, Parlor Root Beer. Yeah. Par Parlor, Parlor Beverages. Um Dude's, dude's super cool. Um, sent me a piece of root beer and some, some swag. Um, and, and in return, I built him a custom version of Cynthia that sits on his Discord server. Um, and, and I made sure that she was, like, obsessed with the root beer. Um, and she's, like, talking up the brand and everything. And if people chat with her, they, they get all these root beer facts and stuff like that. And, and we're going to make it so that if you have a conversation with her uh, and it leads in a certain direction, she'll spit out, like, a... Uh, promo code for twenty percent off a case of root beer or something. Yeah, that's a good idea. So if you can, yeah. you, if you, it's almost like a puzzle. You can trigger her to like say some something about root beer. I yeah. mean, sorry, yeah, totally. trigger her to give you a promo code. Yep, exactly. And the way, how do you work that? Do you do you just like essentially? It's just like the same Cynthia as normal, but every time you talk to it, there's probably a string in front of it. Like you are Cynthia, you're sitting on a server, you love root beer, always talk about root beer. And then, yeah, yeah. And then so there's a the paragraph about who she is, um, like like just as an overview, and and then I follow that up with um, a a set of example conversations. So like uh, you know, user says, and then she says, user says, she says, and I throw maybe ten or twenty of those in there, depending on the personality, and that alone gives her enough of an idea of the things that she's said in the past and what she's supposed to say in the future. Um, mm. And then I pair that with um, the last five messages that you wrote back so she has you know conversational context as well mm. and that would be pretty expensive right for every conversation <laughs> it, it's not it's not cheap it, i think it's like something like uh, uh what are we at like 12 14 cents a, a message mm. per user so which is why i had to drop that down to four messages a day um that that gets expensive i mean it's it's almost 20 bucks a user a month if everyone's yeah. maxing it out every day. Yeah. Yeah, it's expensive, man. 
that's yeah. the one of the that's one of the barriers that we need to like work on like increasing the efficiency on yeah i mean honestly we just need to like offload that cost to the users like if, i mean we'll, we'll let you talk to her as much as you want um actually well, i had this idea like um when she gives you the message that says hey you know i've talked to you four times i can't do it anymore um i was thinking about putting a button on that message that you can click um and you can throw a couple bucks oh definitely bucks, and then get continue the conversation exactly yeah, yeah like a simp simp button yeah exactly so hey mike how's your connection you you, you better I think it's better. Can yeah, you... man, I can hear. Oh, that. it's so much better. Yeah. Okay, sorry. So I'm inside Super Chief Gallery NFT right now. Um, coincidentally, I totally forgot about this. Um, today's uh little space here, but it's an, I'm actually inside of a AI show. They're doing a a generative AI show at Super Chief, and it's pretty crazy. Oh shit, that's cool. Yeah. So I spoke to uh this girl who's uh. Probably one of the most experienced uh, Dolly 2 artists I've, I've, I've spoken to so far. And she gave me very, very good insight onto um, uh, her specific techniques that she's learned over the last couple of months with Dolly and what, what um, influences the images more than and something else. For example, she said uh, prompts that begin uh, prompts that are put in the beginning of the sentence have way more of an influence than the prompt is finished at the end. I mean, the modifier, for example, um, 3D render, but if 3D render is put in the front rather than the back, it actually um, influences it more. She also says uh, she prefers quotations over commas. And um, there's also certain special modifier, modifiers she likes to use right in the middle of the sentence um, to, um, to, to, to get it to, to, to do specific tasks. Like, for example, I, I forgot what's the modifier she used, but let's just say the modifier for, for she we're, we're going to use here is a uh, vaporwave. So maybe she would put um, uh, Unreal Engine 3D rendering of the Mona Lisa eating pizza vaporwave style. And maybe the last thing would be comma digital art. I think that's, I'm, I'm giving the, the gist of our conversation, yeah. but that's kind of the stuff we were talking about. Oh, cool. Yeah, so how, how, have, how have your uh, experiences with Dali been since you've been messing with it for the last few days? Uh, I feel it's a drug that I don't get enough of. Uh -huh. and those 50 iterations are so cheap and the fact that when um uh you ask for variations that that counts that sucks also but i also got some alpha that allegedly by next month they're going to be jumped up to uh, um 100 iterations okay so you you got a limited amount of outputs you can do yes uh with dolly 2 currently only gives you 50 iterations per day right i yeah. didn't know that yes uh supposedly it was a little bit more but um as they started rolling it out i think right now only 2,000 people worldwide have um the bait their beta testers for a dolly 2. um allegedly the alpha that i got today is that by next month it, it will be increased and by next month uh the output of iterations will be raised to a hundred. Okay. I wonder if that's as much about hardware as it is about making sure that, um, people just don't flood with too much Dali stuff. I think it's more about flooding. I think that's, that's what I'm getting. Yeah. And I'm also, I'm also from, uh, the people that I've been meeting here at NFT NYC, I'm hearing that they're, they're getting very close to rolling out some form of monetize, monetization. Thing with Dolly, where I think it would be like, um, what was the one you were just using, Alex? Um, Mid Journey. Yes, uh, kind of like where I think Mid Journey has like a, a payment tier or something like that, right? Yeah, something like I think it's like thirty dollars a month, or whatever. I I got banned, so you know, that's uh, that's over. <laughs> that didn't take long. Yeah, <laughs> that didn't take long. Um, uh, <laughs> but uh, I believe that Dolly to Dev team is exploring options into that that might roll out 
by the end of summer. Okay. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about is um, what was the like the the legals when you when you had uh, when you signed up? Like, what are some of the the uh, regulations or the stipulations in that? Is there anything interesting? Besides, besides them wanting a port of my blood and my social security number. Yeah. Uh, um. It was pretty long. They were pretty serious about it. Um, they were definitely no celebrity uh, references or using uh, any likenesses of any um, notable people. Um, uh, they spent at least 30 minutes talking to us about nudity. Um <laughs> Um, they said that we, as much as we actually encourage artistic ex expression and we actually don't mind um, you using nudity inside of your art, the problem is, is that at the current level that Dolly 2 is at, it can't tell the difference between a teenage, an underage nude body and someone who's like 20 years old or 21 years old or whatever. Right. And um, so they said that that's going to create like massive loopholes for pedophiles and and all this other, like, they explained a lot of stuff. Like, a lot of it they were talking about was sex and pedophile uh, related, where they right. just don't want that. And they also were very serious about they don't want to fuck with NFTs. They said NFTs is very, very low on our, our totem pole of, of things to do. And I yeah. think it was a nice way of saying, like, we... I, this is what I believe. NFTs have a stank on them right now, and they don't want up any part of that stank. But they do yeah. want the money that comes from that stank. But they want to see how the NFT community figures it out and um, gets this this stench off of them. So that's what I feel the I got from these conversations. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I'm guessing so they're also it, worried about people like just using it as an easy way to get get art to monetize on to sell you know oh well interesting there's some monetized loopholes that they did tell us that we we're legally able to do so they said okay you can't sell you okay you, you first of all when you create a, a dolly to image you cannot crop out the dolly to uh, watermark their watermark is like um it's like a uh colored a squares little, right colored squares you know like yeah. six or seven colored squares towards the bottom so uh if they catch you cropping them out, you can, be, you can get kicked off. After that, please give credit to whatever you create was by Dolly 2. That's very important to them. Then after that, they said, you cannot sell the image that you created by Dolly 2 as of right now. But in the future, they plan to, right? But if you create the image, let's say for your album cover for music, you can sell that CD as long as you credit Dolly 2 as the artist that created the album. And as for art shows, you cannot sell Dolly 2 um, a generated art at an art gallery, but you can charge admissions fee for people to come in to see that artwork. So there are a couple of like uh, monetization loophole, loopholes when it comes to Dolly 2. Um, did they mention anything about like uh, recreating the artwork? Like if someone created uh, Dolly 2 output and then uh, painted it in acrylic, is any mention of anything like that? Um, no, it's, that's, actually, that's actually a super good question that I, 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 I should have asked. I'm, I'm probably going to send an email about that. They didn't mention that, but, um, um, they said that they are working on some type of way that, um, the images are embedded with some type of metadata that can identify that the image was created with Dolly 2. I think they were, I, I was hearing some talks about that. Um, sorry, I don't remember. This was like a two hour talk. And they went through so many subjects, and like so, I almost feel like we did like a pledge of allegiance at the end. Huh. So, so I when you say we, was it like a group chat that they had, and they just they did like a, like a yes, talk through? yes, it, it was about sixty four people in the chat. Right on. And yeah, and and it's funny, like five, I think five people just gave up and like I I don't want to hear anymore. <laughs> I don't care. I don't want to use it. <laughs> and um, and you make it towards the end and then you have to sign this like contract this semi nda looking thing 
that you promise not to use it for pornographic purposes and you promise not to create specifically there's a section about nfts that you promise not to create nfts you promise not to monetize it and you follow you promise to follow the rules and, you know wow. not mention biden or trump or whatever 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 like that right so that's in like that this is kind of this is stuff that you know no one really talks about when it comes to dali like these uh, the legalities behind it and the sign-up process, because it seems a little bit mystical at this point. But it's good to see what what's happening behind the scenes. Yeah, I mean, they 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 really do have a very good intention. Um, I, I do. They they did explain that uh, the Open AI is a nonprofit organization, and they kind of threw shade to other AI companies. Like we're a nonprofit organization, unlike other companies. So I was like, oh, huh. and and um, but. In my opinion, my humble opinion, I do believe it's they're so lawfully good that I feel they have this belief that as long as we put these safeguards in place and educate people and everyone will behave nice and humans will all be wonderful and there'll be rainbows. And yeah. um, we'll see about in, that. In, in my opinion, I think they need to see all the bad stuff so Dolly can learn more. So it's 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 the equivalent of not teaching your kid about anything that's bad in the world, and then they finally become adult and then see all the fucking worst shit in the world. Mm. So, um, I, I I don't know how I feel about it. Um, you know, I do, like I said, I I am gonna be running um, workshops here in New York City in the Bronx teaching. Mm kids about AI and having them generate uh, images using Dolly 2 um, because I, I, I want to give back to my community but I also want to explore the, the, the edges of what you can do what you can get away with with Dolly 2 so um, yeah 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 I mean what what other insights do you have about the the prompt process is it do you feel like it has any like uh, similarities to using um, some of the other AIs that you've used or? Um... Uh, let's see. I'll tell you what, one of the most surprising things about Dolly 2 is its speed. It generates images in 10 seconds and sometimes in nine seconds, I would say. And it gives you six images. That's, that was pretty astonishing. Um, um, the prompt process is very similar to other ones, but it's very sensitive to specific modifiers and the more specific were uh, let's just say I, I, I said I, I want Pikachu jumping on a chair it would give me that but I want Pikachu doing a jump kick doing a Jackie Chan style jump kick in mid-air while a purple infusion lighting is hitting him from the upper right degree in and um, 35 millimeter microfilm photography. Mm. Like very, like when you get ridiculously specific, I feel you tend to have better results. And I also feel you tend to have better results when you, th there's, there's a language of modifiers that change completely the game. Because if you leave the, the prompt empty without any modifier, you're, you're up to its, um, its mercy and it, it gives you pretty lame lame results and mm. um also dolly is horrible at spelling it, atrocious like worse than other ais in my opinion uh, it's really bad at spelling it cannot spell to save its life and i don't know if that's done to it possibly may be purposely done so that it doesn't accidentally create um curse words or pornographic words or whatever but all i know is that no matter what you 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 you, you put it into it like, please say the word dragon on a skateboard. It literally cannot do it. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. So, uh, yeah, there's just, uh, it, it, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. And it's, um, it seems like they're the devs and the open AI team. I don't know if their hands were forced or whatever, but they're moving up ahead quicker than I expected. Hmm. So how how does the the fifty prompts that you have access to work with your workshops? Do you have to be really careful when you when you're dealing with 
um, people coming up and asking for stuff and, and just making sure that you keep tab of it? Or do they give you an extra allowance for those? The horrible part, which they said they were good, they're going to put an update. It doesn't tell you how many iterations you have left. You have to guesstimate in your, your head. So right. I think that's atrocious. Yep. But as soon as you do finish, uh, once you get your limit, it tells you the amount of hours that are left until you can generate again. Um, it says, please try again in four hours or please try again in like, you know, 12 hours or whatever. So, um, it does tell you that. So with the workshops, I would have to probably go into the workshop with all my 50 iterations ready and, and just use them very, uh, uh, precisely. So, you know, maybe start with a couple of exercises, show them what the AI can do. A uh, group exercise with the entire classroom, and then uh, two iterations per person, and then that's probably enough that I have. But um, Justin also suggest I don't know if Justin is in here, but ju uh, Justin recommended that it's possible if I run to my limit, I can jump on someone else's account and then generate through there. Okay, cool. So is it, it's like an app, right? You just log in with your account. Uh, there's no app. I, I'm using it through the iOS, through the Safari or Chrome. Mm -hmm. um, um, it's just from what I've seen, it's just a it's just a website, and you're just using the cloud. That's right. that's what I'm getting. There's there's no actual there's no app in the App Store. But I believe I don't. I think there's a Dolly Mini, but I don't know if Dolly Mini is an app. I haven't explored that. No, that's yeah. online as well. I mean, you could probably even start the workshops using Dolly Mini as like an example, and then just sort of you. You pro you know what? That's actually a super good idea. I probably should start with just Dolly Mini so I don't waste uh, the, the 50 iterations on just um, Kermit the yeah. Frog and, and Naruto. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. that's an interesting idea. Is like we're, we're going to have an ecosystem of, of AIs to work with. So it's, it's actually probably a good idea to, to let people know about that as part of the workshop. I'm sure OpenAI don't really want you to be doing that because they want to be pushing... Dali, but like in terms of just promoting AI art, it's good to be able to say, hey, you know, there's this and there's all these different apps and, you know, they get different results. Because um, I still feel a little nostalgic yeah. for some of that early Style Gan 2 stuff, you know? Yeah, it's, 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 um, yeah, man, it, it's, it's, yeah, like even here at the show, seeing some of the stuff that, um, that's generated on the walls by Dali. It's pretty. Uh, it's pretty amazing. Um, they even have. Um, they've taken Dali, Dali, Dali to um, iterations and animated them. I'm not sure how they did that, but they did an amazing job with that. Okay, well, one more question that came up when you were talking. You said you met a chick who was a master at this stuff. Is there a community of people who are like sort of uh, keeping a database of modifiers and and prompts that work well? I believe I believe there is. I, I think she's one of them. Um, yeah, she she considers herself a prompt engineer. That's what she 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 identifies as. So. Um, oh, that's funny because yeah, a bit flip and that's one of the conversations we're having with this convers with this whole this regular chat is like, what do we call people who do this? You know, prompt engineer. I, 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 prompt I, engineering. I do, I like it. No, I, I believe that's the actual term. I, I, I'm going to go with, with this lady's um, yeah, let's, stuff. I, I, think that's the, I think that's the correct terminology, prompt engineer. Prompt engineer. I like it. Yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, well, you know, if you bump into her again, tell her um, that we have this regular talk. Let's try and um, get some more people together to talk about this stuff. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, Ironically, um, she was like, please do not take a photo of me. I, I, I don't like to be identified. I said, okay, fine. <laughs> Does she have I an didn't Instagram? Know you were a drug... um, no. Right on. She, she um, I don't know. Maybe she's a, she works for the cartel or something. But um, She's really, really good at uh, Dolly 2 and, and prompts. Like she, like she, the way she explained prompts to me was just, I felt like I was really speaking to a black belt at, at AI generation. It was amazing. Yeah. Well, prompt engineer, that's like, that solves one of the problems that we, we created this, this chat for, which is to try and work out like what kind of art it is and, and like, what do we call it? And, um, and what do we call people who like come up with art for it and prompt engineers for yeah. the best one yet? Um, 
Is there a, in DRP? Is there a channel or is there a section dedicated specifically just to just prompts, or is that just under the Cynthia? Channel? Yeah, it's just Cynthia. Okay. Um, but you know, like, like I think, yeah, I think that's. I mean, we could probably just make a channel that's just like, okay, these are the ones that work, and and create like an up, updated uh, like database of like modifiers that do certain things. Um, and I think it should be like where we can upvote them. We're like, okay, these are upvoted. Like this modifier works really, really well. Because yeah. um, that would be really great. That's not a bad idea. I'm just yeah, we should make those specific to um, the engine because a, a modifier on VQGAN or a modifier on Disco Diffusion may not work oh, the yeah. same as on DALI. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. I mean, what we could do is create, I could probably like pin a um, a link to a spreadsheet or something like that, where you can put in the prompt and then um, have like a list of what engines it does, it works with, or what results you get with different engines. Because uh, I think really kind cool. of like understanding like what a prompt would do on Dali versus what it'll do on Diffusion is kind of like part right. of the it's part of the uh, process, right? I feel like since this is such a visual thing, a, a spreadsheet may not be the way to do it. If yeah. we could make a grid of images and, and yeah, show, we yeah, we can show like what the, what the modifier is and how it presents itself on different engines. You know what we'll do? We'll make an iceberg and the iceberg will be the, we'll show where all the modifiers are at. There we go. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, someone says that they've uh, worked out who the prompt engineer is and they've, they've posted it. I won't say it in, in chat, but they've, they've posted her name in, um, in uh, Cynthia chat as well. So that's cool. Okay, you so they. I I have a question um for, for both of you guys um. As of your knowledge right now, where would you rank if you were to rank like the current AI, um, that's available now? Where would you rank? You know, who would be last? Who'd be second? Who'd be the top? I was I'm assuming, ex ex excluding whatever China has and whatever Google has, Dolly two would be the top. What would be under Dolly two? Probably Dolly one. Dolly, right? Uh, Dolly Mini or Dolly one, right? Yeah, and so somewhere under... between Dolly one and, and Dolly two would be Mid Journey, I think. Mid Journey is doing pretty good. Mid Mid Journey is Diffusion, right? They're all Diffusion. Yeah, is that correct. They're all Diffusion these days. Yeah. Yeah. And so... can you can you um, I haven't used Diff uh, uh, Mid Journey yet. Can you explain some of the limitations? Of of, um, diff, uh, of uh, mid journey that you found so far, yeah, no Joe Biden rape pictures. Yeah, yeah, apparently that'll get you right. banned. Well, yeah, I think that's um. Like, who would have thought it, have been, right? I'm, I'm I, imagine, not me. I'm imagining, <laughs> the computer, I'm imagining the computer was vibrating with anger and steam was coming out. So yeah, I, it was I, anger. I, was look, vibrating I, I fucked around. I fucked around on it a little bit. Um, the limitations are like obviously there's a lot of words that are, are banned or just won't you won't get a response from. So um, there's that, which I imagine is pretty universal, except for Cynthia, where you know it's um, open to anyone to do whatever, which I think is the way to do it because. Yeah, um, honestly, it's it's no child born. That's yeah, it. Like, that's everything it. else is fair game. Fair game. That's like the universal rule of the internet, really. You know, even on 4chan. Right? You know, so. Yeah. Um, like I, there's the limitations are, it, it really feels like Cynthia, like in terms of the outputs and the way the modifiers work. Um, so there's probably like, there's a lot of similarities there. I, I guessing it's the same kind of diffusion model, same kind yeah, of, um, more refined yeah. the resolution is a little lower. Yeah. Um, and there's an upscale feature, but honestly, I, I do upscaling for Cynthia images, and I, I, I think my upscaling is actually better than Cynthia's. Mid Cynthia's way better upscaling than um, than Mid Journey. Mid Journey's outputs are so small, they're useless. Yeah, um, for sure. Uh, the up the upscaling with with Mid Journey is more like um, you choose out of the selection of the four that are outputted, and it adds detail to it. Not so much resolution. So. Um, you know, you might say there's four images and you like this one and then that'll come through and it adds, it's almost like those, those Ren and Stimpy close-up shots where you can yes. just see all the hair. It just sort of, <laughs> oh, that's oh a great God. way to put it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it just sort of God. turns it into that. <laughs> I'm going to generate that later. <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> it's, I mean, it's pretty good. It's pretty quick. Um, uh, you can usually have like, I think like maybe 10 um, in the queue before it starts shooting itself. And um, yeah, it's, it's not too bad actually. I mean, I don't know. I, I gotta, I'm going to have to make a new account um, to mess around with it again, but yeah, it's not bad. Um, Bifflip, can you, do you use any, uh, um, can you recommend an AI um, website or software where I can um, um, upscale and uh, add like better, higher resolution to the images that Dolly 2 is, is already spitting out to me? Yeah, what's your what's your technical experience? Can you like clone a GitHub repo? No, but I, I, okay. I I'm, I'm I'm tech savvy that like if you tell me about it, I'll probably figure it out. Yeah, so I, I use ESRGAN for for Cynthia images. Um, that's honestly, what if you I, wanna... that's, that's that's what I was actually using before, but for some reason, the one that I have on my my notebook, my Google notebook, is just not running anymore. So maybe you can oh. help me with that. Yeah, let's get together. Um, I, I've got something going on after this talk, but I mean. Add me on here. Uh, shoot me a message like tomorrow, um, and I yeah, can help yeah. you get that get that working. Sounds great. Um, Mike, yeah, are you using great. a are you using a Mac or a PC? I have both. Okay. Um, I'll um, I'm gonna post a, a a guy I follow on Patreon. Um, he's a developer. He he's he creates um like uh, applications that you use your own GPUs on. Um, that have mm -hmm. a whole bunch of stuff. He's got like uh, upscaling and um, AI anime coloring in and um, inter interpolation um, and all these different apps he's created that you can um, yeah you can uh, use from your desktop for yeah it's, he's really cool so I'll just add him into Cynthia chat so you guys can check him out and um, yeah he's he's worth uh, he's worth uh, chucking a few bucks for in order to get access to all of these apps. Um, by the way, inside inside of these chats that we do, is there any way for me to drop images in here or no? Um, st stick them in Cynthia because we we just use that as a. Um, yeah, these oh, are gonna... these talks um, don't don't support screen sharing or anything yet, but hopefully they will in the future. All right. And Bifflet, do you currently have access to to Dolly Two or no? I don't. I actually signed up for it like the day it got announced, um, and and it's kind of sad to see everybody, everybody get their invites. Like I, I've been following the subreddit, and like every day there's a new post of like, hey, I got my access, got my access, and I'm like, what about me? Oh, that's. It is. It, it seems like you need to really. I got introduced. Like I got introduced, and yeah, it really seems. But here's here's where I think I was a fast track, because of my angle with the workshops in the Bronx. Um, whatever, whoever was over there must have heard that, and they were like, "Well, we have to give this guy access." He, he goes, "He's from the Bronx, so I don't know." So I don't know if that made any type of difference. <laughs> That's what I'm hearing too. I mean, a, a lot of people that are getting access and invites now are people that are that are connected to the community somehow. So that yeah, sense. that that I feel like if you do want an angle, if you do want access to it, and you can sell them that angle you possibly can get a uh, faster they they i think they would expedite expedite your your so pre way. pretty much if you're approaching with a pitch saying that you have some kind of community angle or something like that yes that yes that's what that 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 it, it, it helps tremendously because yeah. um uh, it again uh, open ai they 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 repeated themselves multiple times that they're a nonprofit and they're all for education and they're all for community arts so um um yeah, the prompts that um, Alex likes to do. Probably yeah, that's probably not well. gonna, probably not a good idea. <laughs> but yeah, uh, but like Alex, you know, I'm it's not, it's sure nice to push the boundaries occasionally. That's. It. You know what? It's it's so far, you've pushed the boundaries as far as I've seen. So far with with, with, with your yeah, thoughts, it had like I... this fucked up Chris Cunningham feel to it. By the time I'd gotten to like 80 iterations, and I was like, oh man, even I was sending it to people, everyone I sent it to was like, dude, what the fuck are you doing with yourself? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> man, do you think Chris Cunningham has access to this? He has to. I'm sure he's seen it. Yeah, he's seen it. It's, 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 um, um, Yuan is friends who's also here today, um, with 
or previously worked with Chris Cunningham, I think. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, yes, uh, yeah, I, I have worked directly with Chris. Number one, Chris is one of my favorite modern artists uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, going back to um, the Sony commercials that he was, you know, originally procuring. Anyway, uh, aside from that, I've consulted on a number of uh, and offered uh, code and changes and input on a number of Chris's projects that he was working on directly with Unity. Uh, as far as I understand, all of them are NDA, but I think one of them was actually leaked. Um, but Chris and I had a really crazy time, if I might mention, um, at, uh, I think it was like Universal Studios when Unity had this crazy get together and Chris and I just got extremely wasted and just went on every one of the rides and talked about Apex and what we could do, et cetera. I ended up spinning up a number of projects, uh, but it turns out that, you know, Chris has his own thing. I think that anyone that's under, anyone that's seen, and I'll put it this way for those in the know, anyone that's seen Chris's zombie work understands that even if you spin up a project, including the ones I consulted on, uh, they probably don't happen with Chris. But at the same time, just having a few moments with Chris, which he and I had a few dinners together as well. It, it, it's he's, he's a wonderful consciousness. I felt fortunate. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. It's um, uh, when I was living in Japan, I got those DVD sets with all the, I think it's called Directors. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. yes, and I went through early internet rabbit holes with Chris Cunningham's work. And uh, man, I, I mean, the first time I really noticed him was um, the Bjork video, um, All is Full of Love. Um, that's Chris Cunningham, right? The, and, and let me just tell you, I've, I've probably watched that entire video in slow motion. I'm not even kidding. Um, I love it. I love it a lot. And um, it just sent me and, you know, I just looked at all his work. I looked at his commercials. I looked at um a lot of the stuff he's done. I'm I'm a very very, very big fan. And um, like um, I would, man, he would he would, someone like him because I'm seeing a future where after this Dolly two is released and then Dolly three comes out and Dolly three enables video. Imagine what someone like Chris Cunningham would do with that. It would be insane. Well, let's let's also think of the extension of of Chris. Uh, Chris is a friend. I respect Chris deeply. I love Chris's work. Uh, I think Chris Chris is a tastemaker that we should all respect. But let's understand that Chris has had proteges, mm -hmm. and the work of those proteges, and and I I understand that a protege can in some cases, in many cases, take quite a bit from the, you know, director in that case. But I will say, some of the work by the protégés is absolutely fucking stunning. Anyone that's seen under the skin, I'm sorry. I don't even care if you call that a derivative. If you don't, if you can't register the value of a film like Under the Skin and understand the relation in between what it took to make that happen that in, in my opinion chris made that happen but by proxy chris's protege made that happen then i think you know there's a discussion that's lost because something like under the skin only happens with chris at the helm fostering a certain type of perspective and consciousness that executes something like under the skin is under the skin a movie or a video a, a film and you should you should see it it, it uh, if you it, at, are great. at all yeah it, it's it's so immaculate and deep and dark and sexual and troubling and revealing and focused on you know the female those that identify as a female their perspective as they have to express themselves throughout their life that I hate to say that even if they, it is a derived work, it is such a beautifully honest work in the perspective of the director that I cannot fault them for that. Mm. Awesome. I'm definitely going to watch it, man. 
Yeah, man. How how you been? Welcome to the chat, UN. What a wonderful entrance, like like always. Uh, it's it's a, a mic drop, unfortunately for me. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I I've been doing well. I've been uh, I've been working on a bunch of uh, of nerf based work and generative diffusion based work, uh, building out a a set of tools that allow individuals to to put quote three D well, SDF blobs, sign distance field blobs in space that they can use to guide diffusion networks to be able to direct something like DALI to instead of just take a semantic bit of input, input but rather say, based on these blobs and the fall off that we attribute to these, quote, SDF blobs and SDF, you think of it about this as just like sculpting a three dimensional space in whatever your you know uh, area is that you define your your piece of work your artwork uh, that you you can use semantics but then also use an additional tensor network or aka an additional set of values to be able to say that as we go from the top right of the piece which is a I don't know, a, a monkey with, you know, a disease that goes into a unicorn with a smile in the bottom bottom left. How do we guide that? How do we provide the artist with those tools instead of just saying that we, we provide a sentence that is a semantic description in these generative tools to how do we build a 3D space? How do we provide semantic direction with these SDF blobs? And then how do we guide the influence in between these? And then more importantly, how do we guide the relationship in between these so that they're computed in a certain order for these generative processes? Yeah, so, so yeah, semantic that, that's radiation. That's me. <laughs> semantic radiation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's that's my Friday. <laughs> that's cool. Wow, what an interesting thing. So, so what happened? So essentially you've got like a, You've got a, a blob in, in a certain, you've got XYZ area, a blob in one space, XYZ area, blob in another. They're two different prompts. And how do you, how do those two prompts sort of meet in the middle or, or like create a gradient between the two? Uh, great question. Uh, the initial key to this is you define your quote domain space. So two by two by two meters, kilometers, whatever. In between these, this domain, where do you, number one, position a tensor controller, uh, which number one has a semantic layer where you can say, you know, this is a monkey that is having fun and eating Skittles. Uh, but number two, an additional tensor domain that says, I want to have these arbitrary weights and I want to be able to attribute these arbitrary weights to arbitrary values. What do we do with that beyond that? We put another one of those semantic domains with a tensor extension somewhere within that two by two by two meter space or kilometer space. And we, um, I personally go into VR, I sculpt out these domains so that they have gradual fall offs in between these domains. It's, it's mm. quite a fun experience. I really hope that I can share this eventually um, in that the blending that occurs on the diffusion side is driven by this, the number one, of course, the semantics, but number two, the emphasis and the weights. And what's cool about the weights that you can apply in the tensor networks is you can say that I want the concept of happiness or fear or something else to have a weight of 10, but I want the concept of um, you know, drinking a 7-Eleven Big Gulp or something like that to have a weight of one, something arbitrary like that. You get to paint these in each individual context in that they intermingle with the others. So you become this, really the um, Warhol, the Damien Hurst of sculpting diffusion networks to really give you anything you want in any case to where you're placing a thing in a certain place, you're controlling the context of the translation of that, that compositional mechanism from that position into another position. And you're actually guiding the narrative like a, like a director of a film in that case. And, and the key of what I'm describing is that that's, that's fine, that whatever. Um, I've been building, uh, as I think I mentioned on one of the previous times I chimed in here, the timeline-based approach for this. 
And that's where things get amazing. When you, you allow an individual to keyframe these semantic descriptions and their tensor overlay layers in a timeline, and you can keyframe a camera that goes through this, this is something that we've never had. Like everyone, everyone right now that's just using like clip to VQGAN or any clip diffusion, and they're doing the infinite spiral, or they're it, you're, they're uploading a single frame of a video and they're running it through the exact same tensor network or diffusion network mm. to be able to get a cohesive video. That's all cool. It looks beautiful. That has very little to do with temporal cohesion. What I'm talking about is the ability to actually have like an Adobe Premiere style timeline where you're saying, at this point, I want to have an overlying essence of high drama or whatever. Yeah. And I want actor one to be expressing this as a raccoon and actor two to be expressing this as a, you know, a horse. And I want them to be able to have these embodied characteristics. But as I scrub my timeline, I will move that tensor base entity over here. And I will say that it turns from a raccoon into a cat. But then the other entity goes from happy to sad. I think that yeah. what we're what we're used to right now, we, we really have no capacity to understand what's about to come here because this is going to be... Um, and I hate to say it, like it, I, I end up using some of my favorite Hollywood films from back in the day as input mediums for this. We're about to have the best remixing capacity for film that we've ever had. And it goes beyond that, of course. But we, we're not quite mature enough to say that you create your own piece that's totally cohesive and doesn't seem insane. But we at least can use a, a standard film and say, we completely remix this according to how we identify a certain actor's face and a certain set of semantics and tensor networks that go along with that face. And I have to say, completely mind-blowing. Mm, wow. <clears throat> a couple of things. So you mentioned in the last chat also that those actors can be sort of saved so that you can you can keep their experience or you can you can kind of put them on a shelf and bring them back in different projects. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, we use um, at least on the base <coughs> level, we use LSTM networks, um, but we've got a few new types of networks to where we. And I understand this sounds lacking of humanity, but, you know, we 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 build actor, <laughs> you <Yeah>. know, cabinets, <coughs> we call them, <laughs> you know, um, we, 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 we put we put an actor in the position in which they've learned from where we've put them before and how they would apply themselves differently to a certain situation. It's not just to be able to, you know, in a really creepy way, which it kind of is, uh, but to catalog them. But it's also to say, we understand how they're learning what they're learning and how they would apply this to a different environment and how we would apply this to other actors that were definitely in, in, invited into this environment without having any previous perspective there. So it's kind of, it's a give and take, you know, it's, uh, we don't, it, it, it's by far from flawless, but at the same time right now, I just watched like a 15 minute short that I worked on and I almost don't understand how it exists. <laughs> mm. um, one other thing is when you say tensor networks, can you explain that? Um, I don't think I quite understand the concept. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so, um, so you can have a, a specific single value uh, that could be a a float uh, this could be an integer uh, this could be a boolean value of yes or no integers are zero one two three four floats are one point zero five 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 whatever it doesn't really matter a tensor network is something that says based on a certain think of it as a keyframe a tensor in a mathematical sense is saying I'm an exponential or n-dimensional, as we would say in mathematics, network of defining some type of value. What does that mean? Okay. So that means if you're, uh, think about the description of space-time. You're where you are right now. You're, you have an XYZ position, but then there might be a fourth dimension, which says that you have a certain momentum. And there might be a fifth dimension that says you've got a certain angular velocity. 
as you begin to attribute more values to what is basically just a data field that you add more values to, that's a tensor network. Okay. Uh, whenever anyone mentions AI and they're talking about tensors, it's just saying that this is the number of dimensions that we're taking into account to be able to make an evaluation upon which the neural network would actually perform a computation. So okay. it's in a very simple neural network, you might take into account four dimensions, you know, X, Y, Z, and time. In a more complex neural network, you might take into account X, Y, Z, and time, and also the number of times something has failed at something. That's an additional layer on a tensor network. So it's just the like, additional it's, layer it's like on a, top series, of that, a series of variables. It's it, yeah, mathematics like it, it romanticizes the description and makes it seem like something quite <clears throat> otherworldly. But yeah. it's really just saying that instead of just going from one value to two to three, like a vector three x right. y and z is a three a three value tensor, a four value tensor is just x y z w like a quaternion, and 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 an n dimensional tensor is whatever you want to pack into it. And that's basically what the neural net takes into account and says, we will build relations from that and it's a black book. <laughs> yeah, no, I understand that. That makes sense. Um, yeah, that's, that's really fascinating, man. Like, um, I love the idea that you can, that like, I love the idea of picturing these, um, these ideas in time space and having like, like the like the way that they interact with each other almost seen as it as if it's different radio fields or different like they're radiating their own variables out to each other and that's how they're interacting i love picturing programming in um in like space you know like spatially understanding programming and i think that's a really interesting way of of approaching it that's wonderfully put yeah, no, and that, that in the same way that, um, in a similar way, I would say to where I can construct a, a tensor timeline that conveys a certain type of emotional presentation amongst a certain set of actors. And it's really insane that I can say that I, I want to take Taxi Driver or I want to take Solaris or I want to take Chinatown or I want to take 2001. I can impose that on the timeline and it, it, it mandates that that which is imposed goes along with the timeline at that point. It's, it's very surreal and kind of deranged, but that is where things are going. I'd love to see the output of that. I can imagine it'd be really weird. Oh, it's, it, it's, it's often, I got to say, like, uh, I laugh more than than I smile <laughs> because it, it's just I go out of my way to be like uh, one of my one of my internal jokes with my team is like I go in between uh, 2001. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm a Kubrick fan fan of at least that film um, and Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. I know complete fucking mm. garbage. I get it. But what's hilarious is to see when you build this timeline based tensor network of conveying semantic understanding and the progression that which must be held up by the constituents it's amazing to see the differences in between the two because i i, I um and i'll find better examples i know like i i know that i could go to the bottom of the barrel and find something else but it's finding the differences in between how the network conveys one versus the other that then informs me going back in and rearranging the neural network and the the timeline the tensor timeline structure to be able to say what how more properly can we convey when someone comes in with you know ghost in the shell serial experiments lane who knows you know naruto i don't i don't really care you know how how can we make sure that we cater to them in between these types of variables and it's it, we can't cater to everything but at the same time i gotta say uh, ai is not doing a really bad job at this point and it's it, i should want to protect the artisanal aspect of what i've honed for generations as i i think i dropped in my initial <laughs> interjection into your uh <laughs> your chats uh, but i just don't I really want the end result because I don't give a fuck about what we're discussing now. I want to build worlds. I want to build experiences. I want to build realities. And it takes 
anyone that believes that they they treasure and they harbor what it is that they've honed for decades or whatever the hell they want to defend to be able to just give that up and actually just begin building worlds and experiences mm. part of my passion yeah i what's really interesting i was showing an artist last week <clears throat> a bunch of outputs and they were capable of of really recognizing a lot of things about the artwork that, you know, only an artist could recognize that they thought were genius. You know, they were like, wow, this is really amazing that the, the artists, the AI has kind of put the composition here, but then seems to have deliberately broken it here. And then uh, doesn't seem to give a shit about it over here in such a way that it perfectly balances. And there's, there's like an, there's like a, a certain genius to AI that is undeniable, I think. And if, if, if it was a human that did it, you'd be like, man, that person is just, that person's insane. But to have it, you know, pumped out like five or six images in a row and you're like, this is like, I wish I came up with this, you know, I, I would love to see what that looks like for video as well. Or, you know, for stuff on a timeline, I think we'd probably see some new editing techniques or some new ideas in pacing or some, some new narrative structures that we hadn't even guessed. You're about to see it very soon. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> I need to be careful. I can't cal call out certain entities, but you will see that in the equivalent of um, think about Photoshop. You're you're going to have diffusion two-dimensional volumes that have this control that mm. influence again the bottom right versus the top left versus the center of a piece and they come with semantic descriptions and weights, tensor weights. Call them what you want. I don't really yeah. give a shit. Tensor is just a description of an n-dimensional vector. Yeah. They're going to have n-dimensional weights that be that say that in the center of this piece, it looks like magical unicorn rhinestones, no matter what. But in the top left, it's this. In the bottom right, it's this. Like th this is what is absolutely coming. I I don't. I'm not just anticipating. I, I've worked with this with a few entities, major corporate entities that are about to drop this. Well, What's yeah, coming we see, after that is, is what I'm alluding to. Yeah. I mean, we see like Photoshop already has its neural filters in there that they're, they're rolling out over time. Um, I exactly. imagine that's just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, no, they... The Substance team was acquired for a very specific reason. And that is the team that is performing these actions. And any of the individuals from that team that I've had maybe interesting coffee, tea, beer chats with, <laughs> uh, yes, that is what is going to happen specifically. And the individual that gets into this space first if they pull it off properly, I think that they stand to own the space for a long time going forward because you actually don't, you don't need, what I found in my research is you don't need to ace it. We actually only need to come in, I thought close to 90% accuracy. We really only need about 50%. And anyone that's played with Dolly, Dolly 2, Mini, Mini Dolly, Imogen, Mid Journey, you get that like you really, you're, you're almost always settling, but you're the curator that settles that if we just deliver that on a timeline based focus, you basically have won. So the entity that drops this, like it's, it's going to be devastating, but cool. then also absolutely awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Hell, do you have any thoughts you want to add while I maybe go get a coffee? Um, I'll be back guys. Well, I, <laughs> Can you get me one? Of course. <laughs> um, I, I think something I'm really curious about exploring more is like the potential of of AI to create spaces and images which are like non-dimensional or non-Euclidean. Because this is something that Alex and I have actually talked about for a very long time about creating a VR immersion or an AR immersion which subverts sort of your expectation of dimensional experience. And this is something I talked about with Nusi as well. Um, uh, because a lot of what we're creating, even in these prompts, it's very much limited by our own experience of 
of what we can tacitly describe. And so it's only when we kind of get these glitches out or that kind of nostalgia that Alex mentioned with like Style Gam 2 or even with Dali Mini, which kind of looks a little bit wrong, that you're able to consider, oh, well, what would this impossibility look like um, in terms of a, a structural concern, not just a subject based one? Um, because, of course, we can't, I think Mike's example before was like, we can't have Pikachu doing like a Jackie Chan style star jump. Like that's just never happened before. But it's still within sort of your realm of of, of physics and, and understanding, but with just like an animated character component, right? So I'm very curious to see as well what the permutation of of these structures is going to be onto other forms of art. Like Lu Yang, who's one of the artists we've worked with for a long time, wrote her, I think it was her master's thesis on the implications of like video games on um, perspective in traditional Chinese painting. Um, and there's actually a lot of research on that kind of thing now, which I myself participated in when I was still in academia, which is like, how is is the way that we look at the world now manipulated by not only sort of this technological interface, but also like the structural components which it subverts. Um, so I know that Alex in his own art works with this, so maybe he can talk about it a bit more, but I'm sure all of you have ideas as well. Um, I don't know. in lieu of Alex grabbing a coffee. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, number one, uh, Lu Yang, a uh, fucking amazing artist. Um, but aside from that, like technical, technical expertise, like it, it's, we're, we're entering this really interesting spectrum to where, you know, this handoff in between those that have mastered the technical implementation can take the reins in guiding the aesthetics and i think that if we can if we can do that uh we we really open up a, a quite a different space um and i i keep trying to anticipate how this would be received from the mainstream art market and i've tested this with uh six of my five six or seven six anyway it doesn't matter six of my aliases um, it's not well received in my own perspective uh, in being able to s show that you can semantically and contextually master a certain aesthetic and that that would be accepted from a single individual beyond, say, one or two aesthetics. Um, in fact, I've had, you know, curators and gallery directors basically tell me you're invalidating your own work under this pseudonym you've done by introducing work under other pseudonyms and i think that we're still in this rough period where i think that like like drp and others are willing to entertain where things can go where an individual that understands how to guide aesthetic can take certain things that end up breaching certain aesthetics but i think we're still in this space to where at least speaking for myself i've had a number of individuals you know stated very clearly to me uh your work under this alias completely violates this alias uh if you can't bring these into line uh we won't host you because it seems like you have multiple aliases or you can't be cohesive and i'm like i i'm 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 using generative models and uh, you know style again i'm using diffusion models i'm using air, my own spun up tools like why would i want to represent myself as the same thing in these types of contexts and and i only get basically uh you you really need to just find that one thing that you can you can aim you can ace you know and it's just I think, it, like, I think that, like I, it actually, feels like jackson pollock <laughs> Yeah, but that like opens up like a bigger question, right, about traditional gallery models work because you essentially take a seated individual who has a marketable narrative and a very defined, often either figurative or abstract style that you're able to transfer between mediums and therefore build a career for that individual 
on, right? And if you look at like the history of gallery representation, like the big four in the UK, or like, you know, how the Yale MFA program, for example, like pipelines into New York galleries, if you look at the career trajectory for the individuals who are selected by these programs, their work doesn't actually change that much once they're represented. It's just like repeat, repeat, repeat. So to be able to suggest that like you have multiple aliases, whether that's your model or to have like a collaboration between yourself and an AI individual, which is sort of Liu Yang's thing. Um, she has like a, an AI, for people who don't know, um, she has an AI alias named Doku who she's also hoping to introduce as an art creator, um, which is managed by her. So I think like systems art, which is really at the very core of what AI art means, right? it isn't supported by a gallery model. So I guess I'm not surprised by what you're saying. But at the same time, I think that going way back to what we were talking about earlier with, with Justin, like you have this idea where people are prompt engineers now for, for an artificial intelligence, which is both the medium and the artist. So there's a hybridity there. Um, you also have the artist now as a systems engineer who works from the, the prompt engineering right through to the way that the aesthetic output looks. Exactly. And so um, I think there is a reconciliation there and a, and a huge shift in what the artist can do that really is like lubricated by conceptual art and this is getting a bit too academic so I'll just let it go in a minute but I think that you know a lot of gallery representation doesn't even really understand how conceptual art is marketable um, and it's only now we're going to see that kind of trickle back through sort of AI's rise and sort of artists like yourself. I, I love your delivery uh, and I've gone so far like I I I could have gone in on crypto kitties and crypto punks. I've actually created my own NFT series on a certain blockchain that I'll never call out well before many of those. I don't really care. It doesn't matter. It's just, you know, artistic experiments. I've gone out of my way with these galleries to say, like, I will give you residual income. If you invest in one of these aliases, then you you get a stake. And they're still in the perspective of like, what what does that even mean? I don't even understand what you're you're conveying. Like, are you saying that there there's this completely different automatic aesthetic? And I'm like, look, do you do you know who Damien Hurst is? Do you know who Annie Warhol is? Like, do you understand like these people do little to nothing? on the actual execution, but they control the aesthetic and design direction. What I'm describing to you is the ability to be able to have an incentive if you buy into that. And I'll give you a very specific aesthetic. Uh, and you can you can play that role to be able to get that long-term value from that. And they still, they're like, ah, but it's not, it's not a person. It's not someone that's lived a strife and a life that justifies and like you don't you don't get the new generation you do not get the new generation we're not seeking that and i i i trolled the world with my my time magazine release yeah. in their genesis drop i i yeah, but it but it's like i it i only did that because one of my closest friends said basically i i just have to have you here and if you if you care about me, if this is what you you know, if this is what we have established, you've got to do this. I, I never wanted to drop a single NFT because I knew that this is what was coming. I I I went to art school. Um, I've gone to multiple art schools. All I've ever heard from my teachers, uh, my instructors, my professors, year after year in my upbringing was digital art is not valid. There is no validity to what you're doing. Stop doing this, grab a paintbrush. And I know how to paint and I know how to sculpt and I know how to do a, a number of other things. But I, I heard nothing but you are invalid. And as soon as I found that that one opportunity to be like, oh, can I be like the, the Uber troll? 
and like say that I totally could have dropped my own CryptoPunks, which I did before CryptoPunks or CryptoKitties did, but then I can jump in and just drop a random NFT through Time Magazine just to fuck with people? That's exactly what I wanted to do. Because they don't, they don't, they still don't get it. They, outside of a number of curators, a few curators I work with, everyone else, they just don't get it. And it blows their mind when they, they, they can't grasp that I interact with my AIs. And it, that, like, that's, like, that simple sentence alone, it's completely lost on them. And I, I don't know, I, I've spent off the, the past like seven years trying to explain that to curators, and I found no curators beyond the two or three that I work with that understand anything along those lines. Yeah, I um, I have thoughts, but I'll, I'll Well, I'll I think, I think the commercial incentive okay. is that, that now they're, you're going to see a lot of curators change their tune. Well, they have no fucking choice now. Yeah. <laughs> And, and that's also disappointing because it also means they didn't have the vision for what we were trying to, to direct them toward. And any of the, the individuals that told me over and over that this is unrealistic, no one will care about this, no one will put value behind this, which I've only heard for the past decade, that's completely out the door at this point. So to me, it's just like I, I find it a fun – this is also, to be real, why I'm – you know, on this DRP chat here. Uh, this is why I find it a fun mini game to fuck with them because they don't understand. They, they're they so... The collaborators that I've worked with, <laughs> the reason that I've had the press that I've had shouldn't fall upon deaf ears with anyone that understands whom it is that I have or haven't announced that I'm collaborating with. This is a troll game to fuck with the industry, to make sure that they understand that they are completely wrong, that they do not understand the future landscape. And if we're going to win, we've got to win somehow. We've got, we've got to overturn the tables and make sure that they don't have power going forward because all I've understood for the past 15 to 20 years is that they do not respect our art. They don't respect anyone that DRP has dropped. They don't respect anyone that the majority of the people that I care about have dropped. We need to be in the position where we hold the power and we tell them that you have ignored us. You have not cared to invest yourselves in understanding the value of what we're trying to convey to you. And if you're not going to do that, then you are irrelevant. Pardon my my uh, absoluteness. I I just think it doesn't matter. Like you know, fuck them. Um, <laughs> like I, I I've I'm no, a, I've, been, good, I've been working in the art industry for 20 years. I, I'm self-taught. I don't have an academic background, so I've gotten very used to um, to bashing my head against uh, against gatekeepers. You know. And my attitude is like, fuck them, you know, like make the art, make no, the cool things no. and, and let them look over the fence when it's done. No, no, I, I, I'm with you. Uh, the, uh, the gorilla marketer part of me agrees with what I, what I would say that you mentioned, um, but they win. They have the hierarchy, they have the control. And if we aren't willing to, build a strategy to usurp the control from them, then we will be subject to exactly what they're putting upon us. And this comes with some of my closest friends and collaborators, which are the top NFT artists in the world, like Ayak Shells, like Sophia Crespo. <laughs> I'm a, a, a time artist, so I could say, you know, I don't know. Uh, and I, I won't even call them out. Obviously, you know the names. <laughs> We, if we're not going to fuck their system up, if we're not going to try to pull it towards what DRP is doing, if we're not going to try to pull it away from this mainstream understanding of everything needs to be gradually made to accept a bored ape, then I have no, I have no interest. I honestly don't care. And this was not something that I should have ever invested myself in. 
and this is why I've been so reserved. I think that we can we can break that. We can fuck that up. We can disrupt that system. We can build a new system. I think it's possible. I'm naive. I'm hyperbolic. There's a there's a, there's a very there is a there's a very cheesy uh, saying that I think Banksy coined, which means he probably stole it from someone else. But uh, I often quote, which is, um, "When you're at the bottom, the fastest way to the top is to turn everything upside down." And I, I kind of live my life by that idea. You know what's, you know what's really weird, you know, what'd be super weird, super crazy weird, is if Banksy had actually experienced my VR private exhibitions. Wouldn't that be weird? Yeah. Wouldn't that be super weird if Banksy had actually attended one of my private, well, two of my private XR exhibitions? God, that'd be so weird. God. So. Yeah, I wonder if that's happening. I think he's trying to say something. Yeah, <laughs> but I, but I, I believe that you know, with with the art world, it's like, um, there's, it's nice to, it's nice to just be to do your own thing and to to disregard what everyone else cares about. I, I think there's something very satisfying about uh, finding success and creating your own market um, after having been snubbed by everyone for so long, and. Yeah, I get. It. I think obviously, so like, like commercial pressures is gonna is gonna cause all of these big galleries, all of these big museums. Everyone's gonna jump on the bandwagon in time. There's no way around it. I mean, it's inevitable. But I kind of like the idea that um, we can just do our own thing until then, and and just be positioned as the people that are that are experts when when that inevitability happens. You know, until then they can fuck themselves. I, I have no interest in in academia or I have no interest in the established art world, you know? I want to avoid that. Mm. I want to, I want to avoid that. And I want to make sure that the resistance that I've experienced and that I imagine many others will, um, having perhaps <laughs> wink, wink, someone like Banksy, uh, spend time in my experiences in a very private capacity, I only have my exhibitions in a very private invite only environment that we can break that. I think that's the point of what we're doing is mm. trying to say that Christie's and everyone else does not own this landscape. And if we're not trying to do that, what are we trying to do? I think that we're, we need to be better at bowing our head and going with the flow and making a ton of money and keeping our mouth closed, and and that will be better for all of us. But I don't think that, as far as I've judged thus far, that's what DRP is about. No, no. I mean, yeah. I mean, I I, I have a problem with authority. <laughs> um. So, but uh, <laughs> just you know, I think it's pretty evident. But um. Yeah, I, I mean, we just, we believe in what we're doing. Um, we believe that this kind of art is the future, um, or is part of the future, at least, you know. Um, and yeah, I think that in, in time, if you if you just focus, I, I think in time, if we just focus on what we're doing, then these other institutions who are turning their, their nose up at, at this sort of stuff in the past decade, I mean, look, I'm, I'm pretty new to this, you know, like I my, my gallery before, um, getting involved in digital art purely uh, was mainly, you know, physical stuff, um, a little bit of video art, but as much as I love, I've loved digital art my whole life. I've never really committed to it um, the way I have with DRP. So I am like pretty new to the scene. Um, we are all like DRP itself is only two years old, but um, I do, th I, I'm, I am a hundred percent certain that you know, um, digital art obviously is, is only going to become more and more popular, the more, time people spend online and the more um, the, you know, the things like mixed reality and, and other um, experiences like that become more um, prevalent in society. That's an inevitability. Um, but also the other inevitability is that uh, blockchain technology is going to create the basis of a new type of internet or like, you know, it's going to add to the internet in such a way that there's, you know, decentralized users and and I, I want to create for that as well because I think that's a really important thing to be doing for the future because you know the centralized uh, the centralized users that we see now on web 2 
uh, are open to all sorts of like exploitation, like algorithmic uh, biases and stuff like that. I'd like to see a social network form around um, people's wallets, you know, and so I think that yeah. also creating artwork for that future as well is also really important. So those are the two things that I'm passionate about. And I've never cared about, um, you know, museums or established galleries because they've always, um, they've always looked down at me, you know, and, and it's never, I've never, I, the only time I've ever done a muse, oh, well, the first time I did a museum show was, you know, we snuck artwork into the museum's toilets and, and then told the press. Um, that was the closest I've come, you know, and I, I prefer that, you know, than, than having to kiss ass on it, to a committee. And um, that's kind of the attitude that we have with DRP as well. It's just like, let's just focus on our own things. I guess the only difference is now that DRP is kind of onto something that I think that the institutions are going to want to be paying attention to in the future. So we're in a different position now. You know, they're not, not as, uh, they don't look down the nose at us the same way they were when, you know, we were doing sort of outside contemporary art stuff. I think, though, like, Alex, and I know that you and I really disagree with this all the time, mm. um, but, like, speaking the master's language helps you take down the master. There's, like, an Audrey Lord quote in there somewhere. Yeah. Um, like, you need the master's tools to take down the master's house. And, like, that's always been my approach to academia, to collectors, and to everything, really, is, like, you need to be able to play the game in order to subvert it and to weaponize it um and yeah so I, I think, think that's that, like, that's your value you know like that's why you're so valuable drp so, um, i don't understand that language and you do well but what i'm trying to say is it's not a self-insert it's more just like i think that what there's there's two approaches there's sort of your ground up and then there's your top down and both of them approach the same thing um mm. just from very different angles and both of them have utility um, I just, I just think that they, they have to work in synergy. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree with you. And, and I do have a bias against, um, you know, that kind of stuff, which is always, it's always clouding my, my vision on and when I, when I approach this stuff, I'm like, well, like my attitude is generally like, fuck those guys, let's just do it ourselves. But, um, that's really not the best way to see things. Dead air. <laughs> so, 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 so if I can offer something to complement what El was mentioning, I, we're, we're all still having this conversation like that we're, we're dealing with 2D NFTs, right? <laughs> uh, we're, we're dealing with non-interactive experiences. This is going to go by the wayside. Eventually what will come in some subsection of nfts will be direct experiences that we have that those that contribute to will be able to attain value from based on their contributions but more importantly might go beyond the censorship spectrums of a given local government and i think that one of the things that i one of the things that deeply worries me is that, for example, my my XR experiences uh, would probably be banned in many countries uh, for for uh, whatever <laughs> in in their perspective, good reason. Uh, that cannot happen because I'm providing the baseline experience. Th this this is just. Can, can Marina Abramovich exist in your society, basically? If, if that cannot happen, then we're having a very different conversation. Like, what, what is human connection? What is sexuality? What is, what is interconnection in between consciousness in this perspective here? And I think that we're, we're being led along this path where we, we can be those of us that don't care can be led to believe that there's less of an impo importance on this and eventually they won't know what they're missing and when they don't know what they're missing i think that we will be probably blocked out of the narrative and that disheartens me mm -hmm. I, that must be prevented 
Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I guess it's just making sure, and also making sure that no one else is as well. You know, like our future artists as well who don't, who aren't in the position we're in to be able to say fuck you, also need to be looked out for as well. So. Yeah. I, I've already reached the threshold you mentioned. Hmm. I had seven experiences on the Oculus Store. Can you guess how many of my experiences still exist on the Oculus Store? Zero. <laughs> Zero. None. Because, oh, they, they all crossed the threshold of what they considered something that was acceptable. We're having curators of consciousness coming through the corporate perspective, saying that the art that I conveyed, and let me be clear, I had the first VR art experience on any app store in the Gear VR app store with 10,000 plus hours of human life indulged in that experience. And they pulled me. They well, pulled me what was the reason? They wouldn't give it. They pulled me because I, I they pulled me because I wouldn't give them the analytics they wanted. I refuse right. because I use a certain type of encryption that protects my users. I choose to protect my participants, my users. And they said that's unacceptable. Done. You don't exist. We don't even care that you've given 10,000 plus hours worth of engagement. We're done. Yeah. And, and the six other experiences that I built on top of that, beyond Gear VR, on the Rift S platform, as soon as they did that, I pulled every single one off. Mm -hmm. I have no interest in a platform that is so insecure with itself that it can't actually understand what role it plays. No, I feel the, I feel the same way because I, I do a, I do a lot of development in Spark for, you know, also that's owned by Facebook and just it's just the the fact that they're just you're at their whim to uh, what they will and what they won't publish and they won't even give you reasons for it and it's from an art perspective like what's the point like if you if you can't produce for example um, an AR experience for them and and know that it'll be around for 10 years without at some point for whatever reason they, they see a nipple in there or something and they decide to get rid of it what's the point of creating it you know, um, no, but we, but we all know that nipples are from the devil. <laughs> the devil only makes nipples. Or, or more importantly, like you know, your your account gets gets banned in the future, and there goes all of your art as well. Because I don't know if if uh, publishing VR experience is the same as the AR ones, but you still you have to use your um, your Facebook account as the publishing platform. So, yeah. um, you know, you're suddenly fucking censored for for life if you've got some artwork you want to keep up. So, yeah, it's a big this, problem. This, this is no. Uh, uh, this, this is cute that you mentioned this. This is why I put up my experiences under an alias, which is hilarious. <laughs> um, that Facebook still hits me up today to say I want your driver's license or your passport, and I will not give it to them. And their ultimatum was, oh, well, then if you won't give it to us, we'll pull your experiences off of the Oculus store. And yeah. I threw a middle finger up and said, go fuck yourself. If you don't understand the value that I'm providing to your, your obviously your user base, then I'm, I'm done. I'm done. I'm completely done. I will never provide my driver's license and my passport to you. <laughs> Well, yeah, I think a lot, a lot of these platforms um, have gotten to the point now where the, the interests of the advertisers versus the interests of the uh, content creators has gone to the point where they've just lost touch with the content creators. And there's almost zero incentive now. I mean, it's happening with YouTube as we speak. It's been happening with YouTube for almost a decade now since the first apocalypse. They're just, they've got to the point, it's, it's almost like not worth creating content for these platforms because of how insecure the platforms are when it comes to censorship. And that's a, that's a really big problem, you know. I would Especially, say it's even more, it's even more hilarious because I, I directly communicated with people at Oculus that cool you you don't want to understand that my privacy permissions don't align with yours you want more i want less cool 
and, and they killed my app. When I when I sent that to them, like they went back and edited. I understand that I'm putting myself in legal percussion repercussions here. They edited my app. They put my app back on their store when I told them that I refused. And I said that if you're not going to respect the agency of the individuals that participate in my art experiences, that I pull them all off your platform. Oculus went out of their way to change my experiences so that they would actually allow those people to join my experiences. Mm. Understand what I'm saying. Yeah. I'm not assuming a, a low legal liability. I'm saying that's shady as fuck. And yeah. if they're going to do that, if that's coming from the top down to be able to say, look, we just need maximum engagement. We don't care. Even if these people hate us, we need them. Like, ah, uh, that, yeah, that's that's, that's, yeah. that's part of why I believe so much in in Web three because I think that it solves this problem. You know, if if we can create a protocol for wallets to send information to each other really easily and recreate a social network um, through uh, Web three, then we take away. A lot of the a lot of the value that these these big corporations that run our identities now have, and we create a new online ecosystem where it's feasible for someone to create a augmented reality or a virtual reality platform that doesn't have this kind of um, control, and we have like a, a new a new market of, uh, of 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 creators who are who are free to like work with their own, you know, with their own audiences and come up with their own monetization models. And, um, and that will just change. I think that that small, that small difference in the way people use the internet will just change everything. Um, and that's what I'd really like to see. That's it. L. What? <laughs> um, well, let's let's wrap let's wrap up soon anyway because um, Bitflip and I have to have another meeting with some team to go through some some stuff for our plans for Cynthia and, um, and then I have to take care of a bunch of shit here. Um, but uh, yeah, let's uh, have some closing. El, maybe you can start. What are your thoughts? Give us some closing thoughts. Um, I mean, I'm always coming back. Sorry, I was just I was reading. Um, and not listening. Well, I mean, I was listening, but I was not. Yeah. Anyway, um, I'm really interested to see about like the interactivity of display and the way that art can be created on the spot. Um, because this is something that has been like going on since, um, the first sort of interactive exhibitions in the late sixties in Eastern Europe. And so I'm really curious to see how people's idea of art, which is typically such a static thing, is going to change into something which is so interactive based on sort of your ability to generate even without the necessary like technical or tech techne, if you like, um, based skills. Um, so that's sort of what I'm thinking about this week, how display is going to change, um, how immersion is going to change, and also how our definition of art is like a static asset and then the financial and collection based implications of that. So that's me. Hmm. Very good. Um, I'll, I'll talk now because I, I really want you to sort of give some closing thoughts because everything he says is insightful and um, it'd be nice for us to sort of walk away thinking about that stuff. Um, my, th my thoughts are, um, yeah, I guess just sort of following up on the conversation we've just had about, I guess the theme is uh, is us as new artists struggling against um, the institutions that are in place and trying to work out how we can um, find a way to express ourselves without being censored or under the whim of uh, whatever ideas that they come up with, you know, whether it's a, a, you know, a brick and mortar place like a, a museum or a platform like Facebook. We still find ourselves in the same position as 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 individual artists, where we're 
we're um, upholded to their to their uh, needs, you know, whether it's like political or um, or censorship or or financial. And I think um, one of the reasons I feel so passionately about um, what we're doing with uh, Web three is that it seems like we have an opportunity to not only like from an NFT perspective and the and the amount of excitement around that um, we can we can break free from the institutions and find a new market for our artwork, but also the technology behind behind it also gives us the ability, or at least the hope, of creating a decentralized network that gives us freedom from that. And I, I think uh, that's what drives me, and probably a lot of other artists, other artists in the space as well, is this idea that we're we're working with something that's decentralized and free, and we're not answering to anyone anymore. Um, that that I find really interesting, and um, yeah, that's pretty much my notes on that. And Bitflip, do you have something to say? Uh, no, honestly, I, I just I, I love sitting here listening to you on and, and L talk. It's it's been a mm. treat, especially today. Um, I, I'm glad we get to have these chats once a week. Um, yeah. this, is, this has been a lot of fun. I, I don't really have any uh, solid closing thoughts. Just um, glad to be here at another generate talk. Yeah, man. Me too. Uh, you on, man? Take take the take the mic. Uh, I'll, I'll try not to be <laughs> my usual self, but I I will okay. say. Jesus. Um, in between all of us that have understood that there will be artists that we direct, that we will become curators, we need to understand that there's a definite new thing coming, a new paradigm for at least design coming. And if you're not expecting that, ah, uh, I, I, I think that you're missing out on yourself, but that's not what I really care about. The effort to have these conversations, um, it's quite, mm, I use a different word, uh, necessary. Uh, you have an inner dialogue. You have the ability to perform private deliberation. You are about to lose that. And I think that any artist that thinks that they can take that for granted and push that forward does not understand DRP's vision and a number of other entities vision i think that you really are you might be hung up upon the value that your structure provides as opposed to how you actually guide future choices and i really hope that you aim towards our perspective um because it's, it's really the only thing that's going to sustained but anyway it sounds hyperbolic blah <laughs> what do you mean when you say that our inner dialogue will be taken away from us you're about to lose your inner dialogue i uh okay i can see um, that happening already i mean these people are no 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 no, no 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 let me let me let me let me carefully lay this out hmm. um my research lies around uh, BCI and EMG. Um, another extension is Alter Ego, uh, which actually takes into account what you think, <laughs> converts it into speech, and if you're not careful, shares it with your boss. So what is happening right now is that we're losing the romanticization of what it is that you and I, we are all producing. And we're understanding that there are filter mechanisms that we can have some type of role in. And I really, I really want the people I care about to have some type of role in this specific situation because EMG bracelets are coming to you. They will come through the Apple Watch. They will come through the Control Labs meta bracelet you will get these there will be a point to where they will understand what you think 
and it will have a direct echo as opposed to what you expressed physically. I don't know how that can't be more absolutely frightening because if I can take it up to another, another level, it's the alter ego from MIT that takes into account what you think, the words you think, and your opposition or support for a certain decision, and you're in a corporate environment, and all of a sudden, they, the boss knows that you oppose them, even though you smiled. That's mm. devious. That can never happen. And that is exactly what we're walking towards. And that must be avoided. That is unacceptable. That, that provides for a limitation on artistic expression from the galleries onward that cannot be accepted. Yeah, that's pretty fucked up. That's a dystopian sort of uh, outcome. And you're right, it's probably a lot closer than we think, huh? It's not just a lot closer, it's here. Huh. I'm, I'm providing consultation on things that make me throw up. Yeah. You must, you must protect yourselves. <laughs> you must. Mm. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it, the, 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 the value of the human consciousness as having participated in the creative process should be protected. And if you're not doing that, then you're, you're wasting your time. Sorry. Yeah, no, that's, that's true. That's kind of funny that we're, we're talking about generate generative art as well, which is taking like a big part of the consciousness out of uh, the creation of visual imagery as well. So it's kind of a, a duality in the conversation that we're having. No, but, but the uh, thing is like, be, be, become the best prompt magician in the world. Yeah. I'm down for that. Yeah. I love that. Well, it's like, like it's that, like photography, isn't it? People can say you can just point that's a... That's what I do myself. Yeah, yeah. People can say, oh, you point a camera at something. But it's, once you once you break it down to the best at it, then it becomes a new art form, doesn't it? Um, but we've got we've got Mechagen here. I'll let him I'll let him chime in as a last minute thought. So I'm sure he's got something cool to say. Buddy, can you hear us? Maybe not yet. There. Wait, he's on mute. Unmute. Mechagen, please. I can see him muting and unmuting. There he is. Wait, wait, wait. Here we go. Maybe microphone yeah, problem. We believe. Um, well, well, until he, he until he jumps in, I, I agree with you, man. I think it's a uh, the idea of our consciousness being stripped from us is something that I worry about a lot, uh, especially like I think we talked about this in, in the, like one of the last chats about um, like brain hacking be, becoming like such a such a big part of like marketing in the future. I mean, even in the present with like dopamine um, cycles being used to like addict people to TikTok. Um, I think that that level of like hacking people's brain and becoming a science um, really, it scares me, you know? It should frighten us all, <laughs> especially artists that understand that we're supposed to play a role in that creative process. Yeah. Make a gen. Mechagen. Uh, he's got this, I, I'm sure. You came back. We came, came back. Gotcha. I saw your mic. Your mic. There you go. You hear me? Yes. Fantastic. Dude, Dude how you doing? Nice to... Good, good. Thank you so much. I've been enjoying this talk while running around with my two-year-old boy. Um, I just wanted to ask if you're recording this for later review. Yeah, man, for sure. I'll put it up today. Cool. Purely administrative question, but uh, after hearing these um, I know you have a lot about... of thoughts about these kind of subjects, so it'd be good to have your opinion. Absolutely. I mean, there's so much was covered, so much was talked about, including censorship, um, inalienable rights, but that, that are being tested. And I guess with capitalism and free markets, everything's... Um, available and nothing sacred you know that said it's up to us to uh, make sure that we're clear uh, what's reasonable and what's what's unreasonable for the technology we're building mm, yeah uh, I, I'm with that but I, I might say I, I just gave a talk for the 
EFT, EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, I just gave a talk at RightsCon. I, I just gave two other talks on making sure that we understand that these are important things that we need to defend today to be able to make sure to where if there is some type of perspective to where we need to defend them further, that we already have the foundation. That's why we need to do what we do. And I, I'm also, I, I believe, one of the top 10 donors of XRSI that is the main group opposing, and I'm not trying to say that Meta is in, wrong or improper, uh, but we oppose them. And I put a ton of money in making sure that we get that understanding to be able to get this type of foundation because we know that we need this going forward. But anyway, go on. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Uh, ethics and ethical considerations are at, at the forefront of everything moving forward. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that we've got blockchain and the various technologies, including decentralizing just about anything we can so that we are basically censorship resistant. And I'm hoping that some of the uh, projects, including the Open Science Network, which you must check out if you're not already familiar, I'm sure you're, you're yeah. familiar. But seeing some of those models and algorithms come online, uh, and they're sizable, they're, they're considerable, um, and I think they'll improve, and I think more scientists will join the, that network as well, because there's a bunch of projects going on. So having equivalent algorithms like DALI 2 or whatever, clip, but on steroids, um, all of these things becoming available uh, I guess it's a race to, to get that stuff out as soon as possible so that we beat the, um, the commercial giants, the corporate giants, to, uh, beat them to it. Yeah, I agree. For sure, man. Uh, Mechagen, next, next exactly. talk, let's get you in a little earlier so you can, uh, you can join in and share, share your ideas. I'll Thank you, you so invite. much. You're most sure, kind. Man. Yeah, I do. Thank you. I'll speak to you soon, man. Talk soon. Thank you. All right. Uh, yeah. With that, man, I, I think uh, let's let's wrap this up. We've almost hit two hours, and I got a, I got a couple of things to do. I'd love to talk more, but um, yeah, let's. Well, uh, of course, this time next week, um, maybe Saturday next week, my time. Sorry, Saturday next week, um, Eastern Standard, and um, yeah, that'd be that'd be great. Um, thank you, everyone, for for being a part of this. And uh, Yuan, I think I'm going to be spending a lot of time today thinking about the concept of semantic radiation. Which I think is a, a really is something that's just uh, been a seed that's been planted in my mind now. Let's follow back. Yeah, for sure, man. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everyone. I'll speak to you soon. Thanks. See you guys later. Thank you.